trouble comes and stops us in our tracks Bravely we prove in our striving Trudging together each day Hello, everyone, and welcome to Raw Recovery, a Trudging Together podcast. My name is Dion. I'm going to be your host today for for Raw Recovery. It's, it is, you know, there's something about podcasting that I just absolutely love. Uh, update on the theme song. Uh, the theme song does have a full version now. The full version has been written, and we are going to go uh, into studio next month and get a full version of that. And, you know, as usual, we probably put it out for free because that's how we are. Today's show has a new friend of mine. She's been showing up to my big book study. I have a big book study on at 6.30, 6.30 every Tuesday night. We have a big book study. Make sure you attend that. It's a lot of fun. We're getting ready to go to uh, uh, working with others, the full chapter on working with others. But uh, Lauren had joined us a few weeks ago, and I just love what she had to say in the meeting. And God gives me these little indicators, um, and they're great indicators. I just know when there's somebody that needs to be on the show. So, Laura, welcome to, to Raw Recovery. Thank you for taking your time. Thank you, Dion. I feel so honored mm -hmm. to be on your podcast. I really, really appreciate you thinking of me. Absolutely. Um, my name is Laura, um, as I just said, and or as you just said, and I am a real alcoholic. Yep. Um, by the grace and mercy of my loving God, I have been sober since July 18th of last year, 2022. Ooh, good job. And thank you. And I am honored to share my experience, strength, and hope with you today. Ooh. I celebrated a year on Tuesday. Yeah. What perfect timing. I know, right? I'm so no, excited. No wonder you weren't there Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. I didn't know. Thank you very much. That's a huge milestone. One year is the yes. We yes. You know what sucks is your life belongs to AA now. <laughs> Absolutely, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, me too. So I was born in New Jersey to two very loving parents, and I'm the youngest of four children. Uh, um, my sisters are ten years older than me. They are twins, okay. and my brother is eight years older than me. All right. Um. You know, looking back at my life, I grew up with everything that a girl could wish for. I had two very loving parents. My father wow. was the breadwinner of the family. He did whatever it took to provide for our family. My mother was a homemaker who always made our house a loving, warm home. Wow. And dad's love language has always been gift giving. So he, wow. throughout my life, was always working hard to provide our family with everything that we needed. Oh, it sounds um, like you grew up with a good set of ethics. I did. Cool. I feel really blessed for that. Um, so needless to say, growing up, I felt an abundance of love from both of my parents. Um, at a very young age, as early as I can remember, maybe about six or seven years old, I recall feeling a sense of insecurity. Now, at the right. time, did I know that it was insecurity? No. no. But I always felt a little uncomfortable in my own skin. Right. Um, I found myself really infatuated and intrigued by other people, um, yeah. so much so that I would stop dead in my tracks and just stare at people and just kind of <laughs> get into like this trance-like state yeah. where um, I was just oblivious to everything else going on around me. I, I um, understand that. I really <laughs> do. I, I went through that as a kid because I never really felt like I belonged I just felt like an odd duck yeah. so I had a lot of people watching yeah me too always I remember even I mean throughout I still am like that you know mm -hmm. um but I remember vividly one specific occasion when I was shopping with my mother in a retail store and um you know 
I once again, just kind of stopped dead in my tracks and was like looking at somebody intently and she played a little joke on me and she hid in one of the clothes racks. And when I came to, <laughs> I was like, where's mom? And I panicked for a minute. And then she, you know, she came out and she's like, Laura, you know, you have to pay attention. You're yeah. getting distracted, you know, pay attention and quit Especially being so nosy. You know, she was like, quit being so nosy. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, I, I say that because I think that's important to identify as as my personality. You know, I, I, I've, I just have that in me where um, I'm just um, intrigued by other people, you know, okay. so. Um, so um, I've, I've always found people fascinating. Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to see what they're going to do next and what's the reaction going to be and how are they going to get better? And Yeah. Yeah. And I've always had a tendency to compare myself with other people and and want what they Mm -hmm. have. You know, on the outside, my life seemed, you know, pretty normal and healthy. But on the inside, I've always felt like I lacked something. There was a void uh, of something in my life. Um, Yeah. I've been like that for as long as I can remember. Okay. So I I moved from New Jersey to Florida when I was 10. I moved alone with my parents because my siblings were older. My brother was okay. in the Marines and okay. my sisters were on their own. Um, one was in the Army in Arizona and my other sister was married um, and still living in New Jersey. Okay. So at the age of 11... Um, I flew to Arizona to visit my sister. Um, I flew alone. And um, that was when I had my first experience with alcohol at 11 years old. Okay. I, um, she offered me a beer. And I don't really remember much of the details. But I do remember that I drank a lot. I think I had, you know, about six beers. Whoa. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I do remember um, obviously getting drunk. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember, you know, um, much about the night. Um, But I do remember the next day, you know, thinking um, that was kind of cool. You know, Um, I kind of liked the way I felt last night. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, moving on to my middle school and high school years, you know, so I didn't drink again from 11 until like, um, you know, uh, late middle, early high school. Yeah. Um, again, but you had that experience when you drank, did it fill up that hole at all for you? I don't really remember at 11 if it filled up the hole. Um, I know later on in my high school years and college days, definitely, definitely. So, um, you know, when I entered middle school and high school, I remember again, you know, um, feeling really insecure and not really comfortable in my own skin, comparing Mm -hmm. myself to other people, wanting what they had and comparing my insides with their outsides. Um, Never really fit in with the cool crowd. Um, It was difficult for me to develop genuine relationships and have self-confidence to converse with other people. Um, And I think because I was constantly looking at other people and judging them and critiquing them, I felt like they were doing the same thing to me. Um, So my drinking career really took off like in high school um, at around age 16. Okay. Um, I was an avid roller skater (laughs) and we used to go to the roller rink every weekend. (laughs) And I remember um, (laughs) having to pre-party before I went. I would, I would have a few drinks before I went to the roller rink. It allowed me to loosen up and relax, made me feel quote unquote normal. Like Mm -hmm. I fit in not so self-conscious and insecure And then for the next two years, you know, I attended a lot of parties, high school parties after um, 
you know, we spent time roller skating. We would go to somebody's house and, and just party. Um, and I remember always drinking excessively. Mm-hmm. Um, looking back, I don't ever recall a point where I was like, okay, I've had enough, yeah. you know? Um, I, I, there was, n- there was never an off switch. I always yeah. drank to excess. I drank to get drunk. Um, mm-hmm. and I never turned a drink down. Yeah. Um, so I began at that point also experimenting with, with some drugs. Weed is part of my story. Um, and some other dry drugs. Um, and, but you know, alcohol was, was, was it for me, you know, that was my drug of choice. Um, so the night of the night before my high school graduation, so I was, you know, 18 years old, I attended a party and got so drunk that I didn't come home. I didn't notify my parents. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't notify them. So needless to say, they were worried sick. You Mm -hmm. know, I was supposed to be at the ceremony early that morning. So when I strolled into the house, still drunk, um, my parents were very upset. Fortunately, I did walk and I got my diploma. So, um, but yeah, that was, that was, uh, probably pretty uh, hot uh, and miserable that day. uh, (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I probably drank that night to cover up the shitty feeling yeah. that I felt, but, um, <laughs> Oh, they like to walk and get up there getting your diploma. <laughs> I I know, right? you <laughs> Throwing my tassel up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after high school, I attended a community college and I began working at Hooters, which is, um, you know, I don't know if everybody's familiar with yeah, Hooters. I think it's, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. pretty nationwide. So, um, at that point, I got a fake ID. I began uh-huh. going to clubs and partying, um, participating in promiscuous behavior. Drugs became more prominent. Um, at the age of 20, I got my first DUI. Okay. Um, less than a year later, I got arrested again for drinking and driving, but that second charge was reduced to reckless driving. Okay. Um, contingent on nine days in jail. So I spent my nine days in jail in order to retain my license and, um, not, um, get charged with the DUI. So did you make the cutoff age when it went from 18 to 21 for alcohol? No, I, 21 was the legal age, but I had a fake Okay, so you ID, didn't make so. that 18 no, like no. me either. Yeah. I didn't either. I was mm-hmm. just curious. Yeah. Somehow we always found our alcohol, though. Oh, yeah. If yeah. there's a will, there's a way. Ah. Um, so I was on house arrest and probation for six months. Um, was court-ordered to attend Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay. Um, but did not actively participate while in meetings. Um, I definitely had a chip on my shoulder, was Mm -hmm. in denial, did not think that I needed to be there, thought it was a phase. Mm -hmm. um, And I was just really unlucky and got caught. Um, I continued to act out until the age of 24 um, and uh, got pregnant with my son at age 24 quit drinking, quit drugging, um, quit everything. Good job. Um, thank you. My son yeah. was born when I was 25. Um, I didn't drink or drug for nearly, get this, Dion, 16 years. 16? Oh, ouch. <laughs> dry? Completely dry for 16 ouch. years. Didn't well, drink. How you like during those sixteen years? My my primary purpose <laughs> at that point was to yeah. raise my son. I was a single parent. Um, okay. I did whatever it took to be the best mother that I could be. Um, I wanted to raise him in a Christian environment. Okay. I was a soccer mom. Um, I was teaching at that time. I began my teaching career at so that time. You wanted to raise him like your parents raised you. Exactly. Exactly. And, and knowing that his son, 
his son, knowing that his father was uninvolved, I feel like a part of me wanted to compensate for that. So I did, I did everything that I could to be the best mother. Um, Didn't date, didn't do anything. Like I said, for 16 years, it's pretty mind boggling. Um, so when my son started, um, becoming more independent and doing his own thing at the age of, like I said, 16, I, um, started to, um, question who I was, you know, um, I may have been a little codependent on him, you know, because after, after he, um, started branching out and doing his thing, I, um, I felt really lonely. I felt bored. I felt restless, irritable, and discontented, like it talks about in our big book. Um, And so I uh, picked up a drink. You know, I I was living with my parents at the time. um, And my father, my father had some beer in the fridge. And I remember um, grabbing a Mick Ultra out of the fridge and like here I was a grown woman right Dion and I'm hiding yeah. it I'm yeah. hiding it I, I take it into my room and I and I drink I guzzle it wanting yeah. that that no, you know like wanting to relive um the days you know when yeah. I was drinking 16 years prior so yeah. I um I hid it from my parents you know yeah. um so it's knowing that it was shaming. wrong it, yeah like what- it comes with the disease. Shame comes mm-hmm. with this disease, mm-hmm. and we hide when we don't always need to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so you know, I I drank here and there, you know, for a while. I don't really rem- remember all the details. Um, okay. But, but I remember, you know, drinking, you know, periodically on the weekends and stuff. And then I started online dating and um, started going to, to some local clubs by myself because I love to dance and I love listening to, you know, live music and stuff. So yeah. I was A like, well, I'm going to do we really yeah. <laughs> There's nothing better than sitting on the porch on a warm day listening to music. That's just I, bliss. I know. But I, I know. And I, that now, so that's nice. Absolutely. Me too. Thank God. Um, but I remember, you know, um, having to, again, pre-party before I went out yeah. by myself. You know, I had to really? have that little buzz going on before I could walk into a club by myself. So, um, um there, there was a point that I remember thinking, wow, you know, I am picking up exactly where I left off with my drinking. And I remember questioning, am I an alcoholic? Mm-hmm. Like, could I be an alcoholic? Because I felt like I really needed it to, um, you know, j- to function and to yeah. converse with people and just to feel quote unquote normal. Yeah. Um, so it just gradually progressed, you know, it, um, I did, a, I did a lot of drinking and driving. Um, I remember right. there were nights when I would come home and, um, and wake up the next morning, not remembering certain parts of the night. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 2013, I met someone online and he lived in um, Clearwater, which is a couple hours from me. Okay. Um, and so we would, you know, take turns visiting each other, um, you know, on the weekends and stuff. Yeah. But again, every time I traveled to his home, I always had to have a drink in the car. Okay. I had to have a buzz before arriving at his house. Yeah. Um, and so we just, we did a lot of partying. I don't think that he really knew the extent of my drinking, um, yeah. until we started living together in March of 2014. All right. Um, my drinking increased to daily drinking and on Is the weekend, he did for a short period of time okay. and then, um, 
he went and lived with my parents again because it just didn't work out. Um, okay. There were just some things, some issues that we had. So sure. he didn't live with me very long. Um, and we were estranged there for, for a couple of years due yeah. to my drinking. Yeah. Um, but at the time, I blamed it on him. I didn't blame it on myself. Sure. Um, so my drinking increased to daily drinking. Mm -hmm. um, I would drink immediately after school. I remember um, having to run by the liquor store. I'd pick up some Fireball and, and drink it before I got home. Um, on the weekends, I would drink first thing in the morning. So I was day drinking on the weekends. I found myself... Um, you know, drinking on an empty stomach, because yep. if I drank with food in my stomach, it would kill the buzz. Yeah, I um, get the effect I was looking for. Absolutely. Ex exactly. So, um, So, and I was still, I was, I, I resumed, you know, with, with weed again, I was, I was smoking weed again. Um, and then it got to the point where I was drinking and smoking with my son. Oh, okay. um, so we would, we would go out on the weekends or he would come over to my house and we would drink and we would smoke and, okay. um, you know, this erratic behavior continued for a few years. Um, in November of 2015, my adorable mother had a stroke and she was hospitalized for eight months. Okay. And during, um, my visits with her in the hospital, I always had a drink. Yeah. I would drink yeah. on the way to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I would have my cup with me in yeah. the hospital room. Or Sneak and, out, go have a cigarette, mm -hmm. and a lot of shooter. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, during the the last few months of her life, she was in a hospital about an hour and a half away from my home, and I remember driving home drunk countless times. Yeah. Um, in a blackout, not recalling much of the drive home. Wow. Um. She passed away, bless her little heart, in July of 2016, and okay. I was drunk at her funeral. Yeah. Um, for her eulogy and everything, I, I had to have a drink. Um, shortly after her death, um, I was at a bar with my son, and okay. I was so drunk that I tripped over a curb heading out to my car, I fell flat on my face. My face yep. was bleeding and I drove home. The next day I woke up um, with two black eyes, abrasions all over my face. Yep. And that was the first time that I had to call out of work due to my drinking. Okay. I went to school a few days later looking like I'd been mauled by a lion. Yeah. Very, yeah. very embarrassing. Um, you know, in hindsight, I'm sure my coworkers knew, but at the time I thought I had everybody fooled. Yeah. Well, they probably had an inkling, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't want to, they didn't want to say it, but they kind of had the indications, you know, but mm -hmm. they don't want to be rude. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were times when I was drinking at school in the morning. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. Um, and I continued drinking for another couple of years. Um, my boyfriend at the time would plead with me to reduce my alcohol consumption. Okay. Or, or at least wait until the evening to drink. Um, okay. I found myself needing a drink just to get through the day. Yep. Um, there were a couple of occasions where I was driving and I hit somebody from behind and took off. Um, uh, the first one, um, the, the driver followed me home and I somehow managed to get out of it. Okay. And then the second one, um, cops, the, 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 the driver 
called the cops. Um, they met me at my house and I talked my way out of that one. Wow. Uh, I know. Yeah. It's pretty insane. Yeah. We alcoholics, um, um, to think that we are not intelligent. I mean, we are, but unfortunately it's that intelligence that can get, get in the way of our recovery too. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we can talk our way out of scrapes. Stone cold drunk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So finally, one morning in, in 2018, um, I took a look at myself in the mirror and I was terrified. Yeah. Um, God spoke to my spirit and he said, Laura, stay sober and I will take care of the rest. Whoa. And I knew at that moment that if I didn't change, I would die of my addiction. Yep. So I quit drinking January 2018, but continued to smoke weed. Okay. Um, I had to have some type of vice. Um, A lot of people do it that way where, you know, sometimes it's hard to get rid of everything at once, but getting rid of alcohol is a fantastic start. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have to change your sobriety date or whatever, but really times is time. So, yeah, I think, I mean, I felt like, um, weed wasn't, um, affecting me the way alcohol was. Um, so I justified it, you know, um, in that way, um, I didn't black out smoking weed and, you know, so that, that was my, um, rationalization and justification for it. Um, so, but my life was still, you know, restless, irritable, and discontent, um, you know, um, and I felt like um, smoking weed just took the edge off a little bit, but in hindsight, it was still pretty messed up. Yeah. So during my last day of school before Thanksgiving break in okay. 2021, um, I was driving home and the thought of um, having a drink entered my mind. Okay. So I thought, well, you know, Laura, it's been three years and 10 months since you've had a drink. Yep. Certainly you can have one now. Yeah. After all, you deserve it, girl. You've worked hard. It's Thanksgiving break. So... The obsession just took over my mind yeah. so much that I actually found myself getting really excited yeah. to go home and have a drink. And so I raced. Um, the moment I got home, I raced out to the refrigerator in the garage. I knew that my boyfriend had a bottle of whiskey in there. And I, um, I, I vividly remember this moment. I opened up the refrigerator door, yep. um, left the door open, unscrewed the bottle cap, and just took a swig right in front of the refrigerator with the door open. Like, didn't even make a drink drink. Yeah. Just, just like, took a shot. Um, and so... I returned, you know, inside the house. And of course, within a few minutes, I felt that warm buzz. And I thought, Mm. that's what I've been missing. That's what this girl needs. And shortly after, I took a few more shots. And within an hour, I was drunk. Um, So needless to say, I, I, I took off. Um... I, uh, it it just got progressively worse from November of 2021 until July of 2022. So Mm -hmm. what's that? Eight, eight months. Um, it got progressively worse. Um, those eight months of drinking led me to even more innumerable blackouts, um, drinking and driving, falling down and waking up with bruises. Um, not knowing where my car was, who I texted, what I did, what I said. Um, and quite often I'd wake up feeling 
remorseful and embarrassed and a drink first thing in the morning was the only solution to get through the day. Yeah. Yeah. And it took that away. I I would totally forget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that was the only other drink. Mm -hmm. So by noon, you know, here I was drunk again. And Mm -hmm. by two o'clock I'd be in a blackout. Um, Sometimes would wake up from the blackout four or five o'clock in the afternoon and just repeat the cycle all over again. Yep. I would hide my liquor so I'd never be without. Some days I'd wake up not remembering where I hit it. Um, I'd be so anxious until I found it. And if I didn't find it, Mm -hmm. I would go to any length to obtain more. I remember driving to another county at 7 a.m. to get a drink. Yep. Um, my bottom was in early July um, 2022. Okay. Um, and I um, was scheduled to take my father to a doctor's appointment at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um. I started drinking at, you know, seven o'clock that morning. And by 10 o'clock I was drunk, Yeah. picked him up, brought him to the doctors. Um, I don't recall everything about that four hour span. Okay. Um, I was in and out, you know, um, and I do remember, um, being a little arrogant to the doctor and being very okay. impatient and saying a few choice words to him. All right. Um, I woke up the next day feeling remorseful and full of guilt, um, but continue to drink for the next couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, on, on July 18th, 2022, um, which is my sobriety date, I decided to check out AA on zoom Um, I ordered a big book and knew that I had to make a radical change in my life. If I wanted to maintain my job, uh, my relationship with my now fiance and my family, my home, my life, I just knew that, um, something had to change. God spoke to my spirit once again, this time just piercing my soul with the gift of desperation. Um, and you know, like it talks about in the big book on page 25, you know, there was no middle of the road solution for this girl. I was in a position where life was becoming totally impossible Mm -hmm. and I had two alternatives. There was no door number three, you know, one was to go onto the bitter end, um, blotting out the consciousness of my intolerable situation as best I could or number two, accept spiritual help. Yep. And I chose the latter. So because I was off of school for the summer, I was fortunate enough to attend countless AA meetings throughout mm-hmm. the day. Um, yeah. And then once I received my big book in the mail, I was just immersed in, wow. in the contents of the book. And I could not believe how much I related to the doctor's opinion. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was then that I learned that I have a disease, mm-hmm. you know, I'm yeah. not a bad person. I just have an addiction. I have a disease and right. this disease will live with me for the remainder of my life. But, right. um, there is hope. There is. Um, I learned that my disease is twofold. I learned Mm -hmm. that it affects my mind and it affects my body and that if untreated, um, my mind will obsess about alcohol. Yeah. And if I, God forbid, pick up again, I will experience a physical allergy. Mm -hmm. And once I start... I will not be able to stop. Correct. 
Um, I learned that my main problem centers in my mind. That's yeah. on page 23 of the big book. Mm -hmm. um, and then shortly after attending my first few meetings, I sought a sponsor. I began working the steps in October of 2022, and I went through um, all the steps by December of 2022. Yeah. I haven't had a drink or smoked Ooh. weed since July 18th, 2022. So it's been a year and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so a year and five days. Yep. Um, Woo. <laughs> um, I apply the 12 steps. I, I have applied the 12 steps to quit vaping. Um, I quit Whoa, vaping on the 1st of 2022. So I can honestly say I have no external device. Um, not device, vice. I have no yeah. external vice, um, <laughs> you know, except for God. Yep. So when I, when I started working with my sponsor, steps one through three were, were pretty easy for me to okay. accept. Um, and I was ready to dive into step four, but of course I did work all the steps with my sponsor. Correct. So, you know, um, the first step, I admit that I'm powerless over alcohol. Um, I'm powerless over everything, Dion, yeah, everything I, in my life, I not agree. just alcohol. Yeah, I, I um, say that I have an addictive personality. Me too, and for I sure. Go with that. For and sure. It, it actually kept me away from some very hard drugs. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I can... Um, do everything in excess. There's like no happy yep. medium for me. I mean, they're all in yep. or I'm all out, you know? Yep. Um, so on page 21 of the big book, um, <laughs> and I am, I am a big book thumper. I love this too. book. I know what you're talking about. I'm a um, 21 drunk so too. I, I live my life um, according to everything that's in the big book. I right. absolutely yep. love it. Yep. So it talks about the real alcoholic, you know, it says, um, she may start off as a moderate drinker. She may or may not become a continuous hard drinker, but at some stage of her drinking career, she begins to lose all control yep. of her liquor consumption once she starts to drink. Yeah. And that is totally me. Yep. I am powerless over alcohol. Um, the second step, um, you know, it's like, if I know that my problem is powerlessness, then my solution has to be power, right? Yeah. So if, if my if my problem is I'm powerless, yeah. I have to obtain power in yeah. order to live life on life's terms. Yeah, lack of power. So, exactly. exactly. So, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to come into the program with faith. I felt like God had built this hedge of protection around me my entire life. So um, I believe that, you know, God is the only power that can restore me to sanity and manage my life. Yep. Um, and, and on page 25 of the big book, it talks about there is a solution, a singular one solution. Correct. Almost, almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confessions of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. Requires. Right. Exactly. It's not optional, Dion. No. Nope. It's a requirement. Yeah. My, my sponsor told me that, um, he said, in here, these suggestions aren't for you. These aren't suggestions, Dion. You got to do this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I took I took it as fact. I listened mm -hmm. to him on that. Yeah, me too. And then it goes on to say, but we saw that it really worked in others, and we had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. When therefore we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us mm -hmm. but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We had found much of heaven and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. 
The great fact is this, and nothing less, that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our entire attitude toward yeah. life, toward our fellows, mm -hmm. and toward God's universe. The yeah. central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. So yeah, that, that was step two for me. Like I could definitely relate to, to that knowing that I had to rely on him for my power and yeah. to restore me to sanity. And then, you know, when I worked on the third step, you know, willing to turn my will in my life over to the care of God, you know, again, I knew that I had to be willing. Um, and, you know, it brings me to the third step prayer, which I say every morning, you know, God, I offer myself to thee to build Amen. with me and to do with me as thou wilt relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I knew that I was willing because I knew, yeah. you know, like I mentioned before, you know, there was door no door number three for me. You know, yeah. I was either going to I was either going to kill myself, you know, lose my job, lose my home lose my, lose, uh, you know, my, uh, my relationships, lose my, my life, you know, yeah. or to turn my will over to God. So, um, so that's what I did. Yeah. Step four was a little more challenging okay. for me. <laughs> Fearless and in moral inventory. Oh, that's no. Really that was hard for me because I was, I wasn't yeah. used to looking introspectively at myself, uh, you know? That's right. We I, were always busy looking at other people. Mm -hmm. And whenever I had, you know, those uncomfortable feelings, I had something to, um, you know, to mask them. You know, mm -hmm. I was able to drink or drug to, remove the thought of those uncomfortable feelings. So um, I, I did tackle step four pretty quickly because I wanted to recover quickly. So I did do all three inventories. I did share them with my sponsor. Um, you know, sharing them was another part that was a little challenging for me. Mm -hmm. I felt yeah. like, well, why can't I just share it with God and myself? Why do I have to share it to another human being? Yep. And she quickly reminded me that, um, you know, on the bottom of page, I think it's 72, it talks about if we skip this vital step, we may yep. not overcome drinking time after time. Newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives, trying to avoid this humbling experience. They have turned to easier methods. And of course, the easier method is getting drunk. Yeah. You got to so, uh, say it out loud and tell on yourself. Mm -hmm. there, there's, there's power in pen to paper and there's power in just talking and telling your story. Um, mm -hmm. like the fourth and fifth step. Yep. And how freeing that was, you know, I was, I was really nervous and had some trepidation, you know, prior to, to sharing all three inventories with her, but, um, Fortunately, she has a lot of time and she was able to ask me questions that really got me thinking those yeah. thought provoking questions that allowed me to see that, um, you know, it's really, um, you know, I played a part in, in all of those, in all of those resentments that I had, all of my yeah. fears, all the harms that I've done, um, you know, and I never really thought about it like that, you know, so um, this, this program has really helped me learn about myself mm -hmm. and about how I treat yeah. people and how I treat myself. Um, so, yeah. And then on step six, you know, um, 
I was ready. You know, once I identified my character defects in yeah. steps four and five, I was ready to have God remove them. Um, you know, six is just having the willingness to have him remove them. And then, yeah. of course, seven is asking him to remove my shortcomings. And, um, you know, in, in the in the 12 and 12, the 12 steps and 12 traditions on on page 70 or no 63 on page 63 it, it talks about um the sixth step is the step that separates the men from the boys right um it talks about how um if we have enough willingness yeah. and honesty to um you know, ask God to remove our character defects without reservation, mm -hmm. then um, our obsession will be lifted. Like the yeah. obsession to drink was lifted, you know, pretty early um, for me. Um, I, I don't really recall um, even the first couple of days I was very foggy, but I don't yeah. recall like really craving a drink. Um, I think because I just knew that I couldn't, like, I just yeah. knew I was at the point where there was just no contemplation about it. It may have been removed from the very beginning for you. That, that happens for some of us. Yeah. 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 So I, I don't, I don't, thank God. I don't really um, have to fight that. I'm in that position of neutrality that like it talks yeah. about in the book. Yep. Yeah. It's a much better place to be. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I work six and seven every day. I have to um, ask God every day to help me be willing to remove my shortcomings, my handicaps, my character yeah. defects, my liabilities. Um, steps eight and nine, I had to make a list of people that I had harmed and 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 make those amends to, to people. And I did that pretty quickly. Um that in and of itself was a very um, humbling experience. Yeah. Um, but I was fortunate enough to have everyone that I made amends to be very receptive and they oh, were, nice. they yeah. were very forgiving and loving. So I feel blessed about that. Uh -huh. um, and then 10, 11 and 12 is what I live in daily, every day, yeah. throughout the day. You know, 10 is continuing to take a personal inventory and when wrong, promptly admit it. Um, I complete a nightly inventory every day and I share it with other women. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important for me to do that because it allows me to deal with resentments on the spot and make amends yep. quickly. Yep. Um, I don't have to wait until it festers. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm able to deal with it right away. Um, on page 84 and 85, um, this is one of my favorite quotes in the book. It says, Okay. This is this is the tenth step promise. It says, oh, and we okay. have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even yeah. alcohol. For by this time, sanity will have returned. We will yeah. seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. So if it's been given to me, that means God yeah. has gifted me with it, right? It right. just comes. That is the miracle of it. We're not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality, yeah. safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. <laughs> it yeah. does not exist for me. Yeah. I'm neither yeah. cocky nor am I afraid. That is my experience. That is how I react as long as I keep in fit spiritual condition. 
I exactly. And you know, I love to go out. My fiance and I, we go out and we listen to live bands. He's a normie, so he can drink and do his thing. I have the best time. I don't think about alcohol. I can be yeah. around people that are drinking. I like to see people having fun. Yeah. You know, I, I find that I don't even judge them, which is yeah. crazy. You know, it's like, wow, damn, you're having a good time. You go, girl. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, you know. And I just, I love my life today being yeah. completely sober. It's just absolutely amazing the the freedom is is beautiful and you know once you get to the 10th step and and you know sanity is returned you know our thought process is more along the lines of of how can i go there and make it better you know you don't even think about alcohol anymore exactly. there be alcohol there? we don't even right. think about it you right just go because it's who you are now right. and you're safe and protected because you right. have that daily reprieve. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The grace every day. Okay. You're right. It's just, it's totally amazing. Um, which leads me to step 11. You know, step 11 is sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his mm -hmm. will for me and the power. There's that power. That's the solution. Yep. And the power to carry it out. So, so um, you know, 86 through 88, I absolutely love. It talks about what to do when I retire at night. Like I said, that's my nightly inventory. I, I have those questions in my notes on my phone. I answer those questions every day. I shoot them off to other women. They share theirs with me. We hold each other accountable. We pray for one another. Mm -hmm. Um and then upon awakening is on pages 86 through 88. I ask God to give me intuitive thoughts. I ask him to direct my thinking. I ask it to be divorced from self-pity, dishonesty, self-seeking motives. Um, but I have to be mindful of my thoughts and my yeah. actions throughout the day. I can't yeah. just pray about it. And then revisit it at the end of the day and be like, how did I do? No, I have to be conscientious of how I'm treating other people, what my thoughts are. If I find a character defect racing across my mind, I, I try to catch it. Sometimes I'm successful. Sometimes I'm not. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of pausing um, oh, yeah. and, and, and I pray before I proceed. And, you know, it's just it's just amazing. Yeah. Um, and then step 12, you know, the last step of this amazing mm -hmm. program is having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. So that's like the goal, right? The goal is to have a spiritual experience because yep. that's the solution. You know, if, if, if the problem is I'm powerless and the solution is power and the, and mm -hmm. the, the power comes from the spiritual experience. Yep. I have to have that spiritual experience or awakening as the result of the steps. Yeah. And I try to carry the message to other alcoholics and non-alcoholics um, and practice the principles, all 12 steps in all of my affairs. Yeah. You know, so today I'm, I'm sponsoring women. I have sponsees that are sponsoring other women. Yeah. I, um, you know, I, I, I go to meetings every day. I participate in meetings. I, um, you know, I have that uncircumstantial joy most of the time okay. um, where I just feel um, a sense of security, fulfillment, yeah. contentment, um, yeah. just and, that and overall, it, just that overall peace. Yeah. And, that's just a uh, real balance in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have just as many problems, if not, heck, I had problems right before this, right? But now right. I can handle differently. Mm -hmm. You know, where I used to react to things like that, now I act with it. Okay? Mm, exactly. If I do this, am I going to cause more confusion than harmony? Probably. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stay out of it. Mm -hmm. Right? And, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes, you know, you're trying to help and I, you know, I have codependent skills too. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I got to watch myself on that. Mm -hmm. You know, 
90 percent of the of the program is still keeping my darn mouth shut you know and, right and listen and actually listening just being quiet and listening to what other people have to say and they will give you indications as, mm -hmm. as to where they're at and then 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 you get to do something really neat because you may be the only spirituality they ever meet mm -hmm. you know um and i like what you said that we don't just help alcoholics we we help anybody that comes across our path mm -hmm. yeah today i find god in my pause you know mm -hmm. when, I, when i take that time to really be mindful of um his will you know um and like I said, you know, the, that's all about being God conscious, conscious, you know, yeah. um, and some days that, you know, it's easier than others. I'm human, but, sure. you know, I, I find that when I am intentional in the morning and I set aside time to yeah. pray and meditate and kind of get centered on God and invite him into my life throughout the day and ask him to lead me and give me discernment and direction, um, my life you know, it's just much more pleasant. So I yeah. love Alcoholics Anonymous. I think this program mm -hmm. is simply amazing. Yep. I believe that anybody that um, is fearless and thorough and honest and willing yeah. to do whatever it takes can recover. Sure. I think it's really important to um, work with a sponsor, a sponsor that has been through the 12 steps yep. that can guide and direct them and, um, you know, just take it one day at a time because it works if you work it. It's, it's right. truly, truly amazing. Yep. Thank you for, for, thank you for inviting me to do this podcast. I feel Absolutely. really honored. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate you taking a time on, on a Sunday afternoon. You know that's what we do it's part of part of the service work you know um i was told to to work my program like i drank well i mm -hmm. drank it all the time every day i drank every day all day so um i am also very blessed that i get to do this pretty much for a living and um you know um you know we all have our sacrifices but gosh it's better than any life I could have imagined. I've got a pretty good you got, that. <laughs> you got that right. I agree 100%. So thank you again for, for being on today. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No, it's a, and for our listeners here, you know, um, some of these stories are different. And, and in this story, there wasn't much trauma growing up, um, which I really appreciated. And, um, you know, but it just goes to show that we're kind of born with this disease and it's not up to us. So remember, it's not your fault. It, you weren't, you didn't ask to be an alcoholic. You didn't ask to be an addict. You, know, you were born with this disease. Now that doesn't mean that we're not going to take responsibility for our actions. Okay. But maybe a little bit nicer to yourself. Okay? The nicer you are to yourself, the nicer you're you're going to be to the people around you. So, you know, don't give up. Just don't give up. Keep trying. Keep going back. I relapsed 22 times in two years, but I made it. I made it. I'm here. And if Laura and I can make it, you can make it too. So thank you, everybody, for being here. This has been Raw Recovery, a Trudging Together podcast. I love you. Peace out. And have a day.